Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Nursing Home Patient Safety Series, Practical Strategies to Prevent Sepsis in Nursing Home Residents. We're so glad that you've taken time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Just a little bit about Alliant before we get started. Alliant Health Solutions is the Medicare Quality Innovation Network Quality Improvement Organization, or QUIN QIO, for Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Louisiana, North Carolina, and Tennessee. And our goal is to make healthcare better together by working with facilities to improve resident safety and quality. I will be your presenter for today's session. My name is Erica Umeakune, and I'm an infection prevention specialist here at Alliant Health Solutions. I also have a background as both an infection preventionist and adult gerontology nurse practitioner, and I've worked in a variety of healthcare settings. So during today's session, I will review the burden of sepsis and sepsis-related hospitalizations in nursing facilities. I'll also provide ample tools and resources to prevent HAIs, especially HAIs that are commonly associated with sepsis in nursing home residents. And again, throughout this uh, presentation, I'll share resources to support your nursing facility infection prevention and control initiatives. So let's jump right into it. Sepsis is the body's extreme response to an infection, which happens when an infection triggers a chain reaction throughout the body. It's a life-threatening medical emergency that can rapidly lead to tissue damage, organ failure, and death. In terms of the clinical progression of sepsis, it's, it's uh, visualized or depicted here. Bacterial infections cause most, ca most cases of sepsis, but a sepsis can also be the result of other infections, including viral inf infections such as SARS-CoV-2 or influenza or even fungal infections. System, uh, systemic inflammatory resp response syndrome, or SIRS, occurs when chemicals released in the bloodstream to fight an infection trigger inflammation throughout the body. This can cause a cascade of changes, resulting in severe sepsis and septic shock, which damages multiple organ systems and subsequently causes them to fail, and also subsequently le leads to death. So here are just some important considerations and facts when we talk about sepsis. About one, at least 1.7 million people or adults in the, America, in the United States develop sepsis yearly, and about 350,000 adults die from sepsis while um, they're, during their hospitalization or even in hospice. It is important to note that sepsis or the infection causing sepsis starts before a patient goes to the hospital in nearly 87% of cases. Risk factors for sepsis include adults 65 and older, people with weakened immune systems, people with chronic medical conditions such as diabetes, uh, lung cancer, or sorry, lung disease, cancer, and kidney disease, also individuals with recent severe illness or hospitalization, including having uh, illness with COVID-19 uh, COVID illness, and then anybody who's actually survived sepsis is also at increased risk, and of course, children younger than one. But it is important to note that the most common infections in adults that lead to sepsis are actually lung infections, urinary tract infections, and infections of the gastrointestinal tract or gut, and skin infections. And that's depicted in the graphic to the right. So to provide more context, too, to better understand why this is important, not just from a clinical standpoint, but also from um, a performance improvement and quality standpoint, um, it's, it's important to underscore and note that nursing home residents actually have a higher risk of having severe sepsis diagnosis compared to non-nursing non home residents, and also are more likely uh, to need hospitalization with higher, higher rates of ICU admission, longer hospitalization stays, and also they have a higher uh, inpatient, inpatient or in-hospital mortality. And so because of that, it's very important for us to keep sepsis in mind as we are thinking about preventing infections in our residents. With that in mind, too, CMS actually has updated uh, their value-based purchasing measures to specifically include a skilled nursing facility, HAI, or healthcare-associated infection requiring hospitalization measure, which will be uh, applicable um, to the FY 2026. But data 
to, uh, for this measure was actually collected FY 2022. And we are actually in the performance period. We as in nursing facilities are actually in this performance period for this measure uh, that started um, October of 2023 and continues on through the end of September of this year. So not only again, is it just clinically important, but it is also on the radar in terms of um, of uh, value-based purchasing and quality improvement initiatives and incentives, again, to ensure that our residents are not having subsequent hospitalizations related to healthcare-associated infections. So what can we do? Um, so here are ways that we can prevent sepsis in residents and reduce the burden of sepsis just in general on nursing facilities. And so um, one, we can of course prevent infections, that's key. Follow infection control requirements like uh, or recommendations as they relate to hand hygiene, uh, respiratory etiquette, cough etiquette, respiratory hygiene, personal hygiene, those kind of things. And also ensure residents receive their recommended vaccinations. Also, it's very important to establish an infection prevention and control program, um, which of course many facilities actually have, but it's very, uh, important that you maintain your program and also just continue to update your, your program, your risk assessments to identify any risk to your uh, residents in terms of uh, additional infections that can cause sepsis. Also think sepsis. It's very important that your staff and uh, your staff, as well as family members and residents as well, but help them know and understand the signs and symptoms of sepsis so that way they can uh, better identify it and uh, initiate early treatment. And signs and symptoms of sepsis, of course, here, here are some examples, uh, but they include fever or hyperthermia, fast heart rate, fast breathing rate, altered mental status, low blood pressure, decreased urine output, and changes in white blood cell and coagulation abnorm abnormalities, for example. Um, when you see those signs, it's very important that your staff act fast. If sepsis is suspected, making sure they order tests to determine if an infection is present, where it is, and what's causing it, and then and start the appropriate in interventions immediately um, and making sure they're documenting the antibiotic starts, dose, duration, um, and the purpose. And then of course, if you're treating a resident for sepsis in your facility or an infection that could potentially lead to sepsis, it's very important that you continue to check their progress frequently and reassess them, especially in terms of antibiotic ther therapy to make sure that the therapy is adequate and providing the correct coverage uh, for the, um, the potential uh, bacteria or infection. So in the next part of this presentation, I really want to talk about targeted prevention strategies for sepsis-related infections. So I'm specifically going to focus on interventions related to lung infections, urinary tract infections, gastrointestinal tract infections, and skin infections. And again, these are just the most common infections in adults that lead to sepsis. It's also um, very important to understand that these infections actually are highlighted in the revised McGeer criteria for HAI surveillance in nur the nursing home population. So there are some um, direct uh, connections and overlap with um, the potential to identify these infections uh, from a surveillance standpoint in the nursing home population, but and also it's also it's uh, correlated with certain infection prevention activities and interventions that you can do to, again, help mitigate, mitigate that risk. So let's talk about lung infections. Lung infections um, include both res upper respiratory infections and lower respiratory infections. Upper respiratory infections include sinusitis, pharyngitis, epiglottitis, and lar laryngeal tracheitis, which just basically means an infection of the upper airway and sinuses. And uh, they're managed, often managed in facilities and typically do not have a higher risk of sepsis compared to lower respiratory infections like bronchitis, bronchitis, bronchiolitis, and pneumonia. And for the purpose of this presentation, I really want to focus on pneumonia because pneumonia is an infection that affects one or both lungs. It basically causes air sacs or the alveoli of the lungs to fill up with fluid or pus. And that, of course, can cause a lot of problems. Uh, rain the presentation of pneumonia, of course, ranges from mild to severe illness in people of all ages, but of course, in our nursing home population, uh, pneumonia actually has a significant risk of um, sepsis, sepsis, only sepsis, but hospitalization 
and uh, potential death, especially if we're looking also looking at what it's caused by. So of course, pneumonia can be caused by bacteria, viruses, or fungi. Um, of course, the most common bacteria are strep pneumo um, streptococcus pneumoniae, uh, mycoplasm pneumoniae, haemophilus influenzae, and some Legionella species. In terms of viruses, um, what's really circulating now actually is such a high risk for uh, causing pneumonia in our residents like flu, RSV, and uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus um, that causes COVID illness. Uh, also, it's very important to keep in mind that fungi are, or uh, f fungus type um, pathogens are also uh, um, could potentially also uh, cause infections in our residents, but they tend to be more opportunistic, meaning that it usually presents in individuals who have a weakened immune system or who have some other underlying compromising uh, condition. Um, of course, signs and symptoms of pneumonia include chest pain, fever, chills, cough, hypoxemia, so those low, low blood oxygen levels and shortness of breath, and usually these symptoms are what gets an individual admitted to the uh, hospital. So what can we do in terms of preventing this from even, from even occurring? And so here are some examples um, listed on the screen. They include, of course, making sure that you have an effective infection prevention and control program and that you're also looking and uh, monitoring surveillance for these potential infections. Now, in terms of like everyday interventions, um, I want to highlight a few here. Oral care and hygiene is very, very important. So it's important that uh, you're encour encouraging oral and dental hygiene in, in residents, that your staff are monitoring for sores, abscesses, or signs of gum, tooth decay, um, or tooth infection, because with prompt attention to those oral infections, um, it could actually prevent the potential colonization of harmful bacteria in the mouth and throat that could then subsequently be aspirated into the lungs. And if you have an area in your facility where you're taking care of ventilated patients or residents, um, it just it's very important that you're providing daily oral care, and uh, especially with chlorhexidine, an antimicrobial solution, and also with residents with tracheostomies, making sure that you're providing the appropriate tracheostomy care, skin and stoma care, and preventing decannulation as well as suctioning routinely uh, to make sure that um, you're um, preventing any type of pneumonia risk. In addition to that, aspiration prevention, making sure um, for aspiration, of course, actually occurs when food, liquid, saliva, or even unfortunately vomit is uh, breathed into the airway or the lungs. And of course, this causes a lot of irritation and of course, increases the risk of infection. Now, there are some individuals in a nursing home setting that may be at a higher risk, like stroke patients, those with dementia, or those with other uh, neuromuscular conditions. Um, but uh, aspiration is just one symptom of uh, dysphagia or uh, swallowing difficulty. So it's very important that when you're um, assessing your residents that you're um, looking for ways to prevent, of course, aspiration. And you're doing this by completing your nutritional and functional status assessments. You're providing assistance with meals, especially for those with dysphagia, making sure that they're sitting upright, avoiding administration of sedative medications, especially or, or medica medications too that also dry up the saliva, especially before eating. And then also that you have appropriate interventions to manage gastric reflux or GERD, the gastroesophageal reflux disease. So in terms of the other options, appropriate uh, care of medical equipment and devices, again, this specifically applies to those who are ventilated, uh, who are ventilated residents, if they, or if they have a trachea, and if they have a tracheostomy, uh, making sure that you're maintaining the head, uh, make sure you're elevating the head of the bed, that they're on pep peptic ulcer prophylaxis and DVT prophylaxis, and also getting their daily oral care. Uh, maintenance of ventilation systems just means uh, basically that you have a process in place to work with your facilities engineers to ensure that um, your airway and airflow, your uh, filters are all uh, properly working and changed as per recommendations to, again, ensure adequate airflow and um, le less contamination in the environment. And then, of course, continue to re update resident and staff on education and make sure that antimicrobials are prescribed appropriately.
Now, in terms of specific pneumonia prevention, it's also very important that staff get the rec uh, sorry, uh, residents and staff, though, as recommended, um, get the appropriate vaccinations, which include COVID-19 uh, vaccination, pneumococcal, flu, uh, RSV, of course, with a shared decision making with their providers, H uh, Hib vaccine vaccinations, as well as pertussis vaccinations. I want to specifically call out a new, a relatively new resource that was shared by CDC that's intended to help facilities prepare for and respond to nursing home residents uh, or healthcare personnel who develop signs and symptoms of respiratory viral infections. Um, this toolkit is quite helpful because it breaks down steps you could take as you prepare for these potential viruses in your facility, how you could respond, and then also how you could control them. So again, it's just an effective way to help reduce the risk of uh, infections that cause sepsis in your facility. Now, moving on to UTIs, UTIs are the most common sites of healthcare-associated infections, which accounts for up to 20% uh, percent of infections in long-term care facility. Um, it has risk factors uh, such risks that are specific to our population in nursing homes as it relates to age-related changes in their GU tract, as well as the presence of other type of comorbid conditions. Uh, UTIs, of course, lead to significant complications, That one of which is sepsis. So with this in mind, we've comprehensively discussed a number of UTI prevention strategies, um, actually most of these strategies in much detail and depth, and I'm going to share the resources for those web and previous webinars and slides and recordings, um, but uh, we have co covered this in depth, but I just really want to highlight them again here. So in fact, an infection prevention and control program, again, is key. Making sure that you have processes in place to ensure hand hygiene competence is there and also audit and monitor to ensure that hand hygiene is being practiced, a uh, paracare competency that again applies to that, making sure that you have education and ways to validate uh, competency related to pericare. Hydration protocols also um, are very important. Research has shown or demonstrated that increasing daily water uh, intake protects against recurrent UTIs, especially in pre in, in women um, who have recurrent recurrent UTIs, um, and also structured drink rounds for residents uh, have been shown to reduce UTIs and UTIs related hospitalizations. So if that's something you haven't uh, thought about, that might be worth considering again to ensure that your uh, your residents are hydrated. But it again could have significant um, impacts in reducing your UTI rates and subsequent uh, hospitalizations related. To UTIs and set in urosepsis. Atrophic vaginitis. Prophylaxis um, is basically the use of vaginal estrogens that have demonstrated effectiveness in preventing UTIs among postmenopausal women. Uh, also, consider urinary incontinence management, indwelling urinary catheterization protocols and competencies, the appropriate maintenance and care for indwelling urinary catheters, urine culture stewardship, specifically making sure that you have processes in place to appropriately identify true UTIs, as well as having a way to communicate them using suspected UTI protocols. And of course, having an antimicrobial stewardship program is key because it could significantly reduce the likelihood of uh, you having problems with multidrug resistant organisms in your facilities, especially as they relate to them being present in urine. So as I mentioned, we have a number of urinary tract infection resources um, in the form of bite-sized learning. So these are uh, uh, usually about uh, eight to 10 minute uh, vignettes, uh, little video vignettes that highlight these, these uh, UTI related topics. We have resources that you can uh, download and also share with your staff and potentially implement in your protocols and policies. And for all the UTI related uh, uh, webinars and information that we've um, shared, we put that in a playlist that is easily accept, ex, uh, accessible. And um, again, we just have or provide more detail in the, uh, related to the interventions I've previously discussed. Now, talking about GI tract infections, here are some common infections that are typically seen in, um, in the nursing home residents and, of course, could have infection prevention strategies associated with them. So gastroenteritis enteritis is basically infections um, uh, of the or inflammation of the stomach and intestine caused by enteric pathogens like salmonella, shingella, et cetera. A neurovirus gastroenteritis is actually quite common and very contagious. Um, 
um, and can lead to dehydration, especially in older adults or people with other illnesses. And uh, neurovirus, again, it's something that can be easily spread, but also be contained very well by implementing transmission-based precautions. But again, because of the type of um, the, the symptoms and the fact that it could also potentially lead to sepsis as well as C. diff, um, it could, it's definitely something on your right, to keep on your radar in terms of prevention and also controlling infections. Now, again, C. diff, I know we've heard a lot about that, but of course, that's a gram uh, positive anaerobic bacteria that uh, produces uh, type toxins that cause uh, diarrhea and really could have um, a significant impact on the colon as well as cause uh, sepsis and um, death if it's not uh, managed well and also if it's not treated. Um, there are different types of clinical presentations as are related to um, C. diff. There's colonization where residents could potentially be colonized with it but not actually have clinical symptoms but have a positive test, but then they could also literally have infection which in which clinical uh, symptoms are present in the presence of a positive test. Now, ways that you can um, manage GI tract infections in terms of also preventing them is, again, ensuring you have a successful IP program in place, hand hygiene, especially when you think about hand hygiene and you think about enteric type infections, you want to think about enteric level transmission-based precautions, which is basically the very similar to contact precautions, but you really want to focus on hand hygiene um, in terms of specifically using hand washing as a way to reduce the burden of those potential pathogens um, on your hands or um, in your, in the, also in the environment. It's very important, too, that you have prompt diagnosis diagnostic testing, when there are signs, GI signs and symptoms that are present, um, it's very important that you catch these early. So again, that they can be treated early and also that transmission can be halted very early on because again, these can rapidly, uh, uh, some of these infections can rapidly spread within your, your facility. And if you can and, and have the ability to cohort to those who are infected and then also, of course, to implement transmission-based precautions, ensure that you're doing environmental cleaning and disinfection and also animal microbial stewardship program is very important here just because, uh, especially with C. diff, uh, C. diff, a risk of C. diff is related to antibiotic exposure um, and also just um, ensuring that antibiotics are prescribed appropriately and not oh, that there's not overexposure of antibiotics can help reduce the risk of C. diff. And then also in terms of prophylaxis, uh, just considering also nutritional and pharmaceutical interventions to promote a balanced microbiome in the gut for residents. And lastly, let's talk about skin and mucosal infections. Um, again, this is one, uh, a group of infections that could potentially lead to sepsis. And when we're talking about that, we're talking um, these about these infections, we're talking about them in terms of cellulitis or wound infections, fungal infections, and some other infections that I'll mention shortly. But you will probably see this more dominant and, and more of an issue se related to sepsis um, uh, in terms of like cellulitis and wound infections. And of course, those are indicated by redness, swelling, or pain in an infected area of a skin. It's usually caused by bacteria. And because the skin is inflamed or um, likely compromised, most of these bacteria are opportunistic in terms of, you know, they just get into the skin and just, you know, rapidly um, uh, uh, proliferate and again, cause signs and symptoms of infection that could, could, could continue to spread. In addition to that, um, often wounds, wound infections have um, the potential to be infected by multidrug resistant pathogens like MRSA um, or uh, some other uh, related or VRE or or some other uh, um, multidrug resistant organisms. And so it's very, again, very important for us to make sure we um, have this in our radar and also are monitoring for those potential drug resistant infections, especially if we're starting to see them in um, wound, uh, wound or uh, soft tissue cultures. Um, in terms of uh, fungal infections, uh, fungal and oral, fungal oral and perioral skin infections uh, could be seen in our resident population, but also fungal infections could be also seen in some wound infections. That I do want to point out that there is a concern with a certain type of a fungal pathogen called Canada auris, which is an emerging fungus that presents um, a global threat and also a local threat here in the United States because it's significantly increased in terms of its prevalence. And it's typically found in those who are either very sick 
sick, who have invasive medical devices, or who are uh, have long or frequent stays in healthcare facilities, or of course in nursing home resident and um, who live in a nursing home type environment. It is a, a potential threat because it's very hard to treat and the typical antifungal drugs that we use to treat it actually are not as effective. So those are that's what you also really need to think about. Um, and, and these types of infections can quickly lead to sepsis. So it's very important that you prevent them. And the other two groups of infections, um, skin infections related to herpes virus is just, um, and also parasites. So in terms of herpes virus, uh, specifically herpes zoster reactivation or shing of, of the var varicella zoster virus, which causes shingles and causes those blisters and bumps and that rash, you know, could potentially become infected due to a secondary bacterial infection due to the scratching or the irritation or even just the um, potential, uh, um, the uh, due to the fact that itself that the rash is irritated and of course that the skin is compromised. And then lastly, same thing with bed, bed bugs and scabies infections um, is it's similarly secondary skin infections from scratching and compromised skin. So what can we do to prevent these types of infections? Same principles, IPC program and surveillance, hand hygiene, but in addition to hand hygiene, personal hygiene and oral hygiene, routine wound assessments and care, implementing transmission-based precautions when indicated as, and enhanced barrier precautions, which is a way um, to reduce transmission of resistant organisms. And that's typically uh, implemented using a targeted gown and glove used during high contact resident care. In addition to that, implementing environmental cleaning and disinfection, and as always really working with your antimicrobial stewardship committee and pharmacists to ensure that antibiotics are appropriately prescribed in um, there's not overexposure that could lead to multidrug resistant organisms. So as I begin to close out, I just want to again highlight that it's very important to improve early recognition of sepsis and again, educate residents, thinks, and residents and families and your staff, think sepsis, act fast, and always reassess your residents, especially when you're starting uh, treatment for any type of infection just to make sure that that um, treatment is, is effectively working and that the infection is not getting worse and, you know, worse in the sense that it could potentially lead to them being, um, getting, uh, uh, becoming more septic and then subsequently also having a hospitalization. Now, what I want to show you is an example of a sepsis protocol here. Uh, you could implement this in your facility. It also includes an SBAR communication tool that can help your staff effectively uh, communicate their concerns to clinicians when they suspect a resident has uh, sepsis. So in addition to that, here's some additional sepsis education tools, resources, and printables uh, from the CDC. Um, I really, really encourage you all to um, print these resources out. Uh, they are very, very helpful, literally at just um, you know, talking about this with your staff in huddles and co uh, conversation, and also um, helping share this information with your residents' uh, families. Um, and also, there are other resources that have uh, protocols and checklists. And in addition to what's on the CDC website, they also have kind of like a knowledge check that you could again also share with your staff to again validate their understanding of just the signs and symptoms that are related to sepsis as well, and knowing how to identify. Them quickly. Also, we just recently posted a sepsis bite-sized learning video that also that could be shared with your staff as well as a learning tool um, that again could just just quickly introduce them to what sepsis is, what you should be looking for, and um, why it's important. And so I just put that in the chat. So please feel free to check that out. And I encourage you again to share that with your staff and your residents' uh, families. So with that, um, I know we're coming up on time. I do not see any questions, but if you do have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. I want to highlight our patient safety team here at Alliant. Uh, we are more than happy to assist you with any support related to infection prevention, surveillance, or patient safety. So if you have any questions or concerns or would like additional information or support, please reach out to us at patientsafety at alliantthealth.org. And also, if you would like additional information about um, all the quality work that we do, please reach out to our program director, Julie Keeker and Leanne Sauls.
and I do not see any other questions or comments. Again, all the, the links to the slides and all the resources that were referenced in the slides have been provided in chat, as well as the sepsis bite size learning video. Um, thank you again for joining us and please join us through our your favorite social media channel. And again, thank you for all that you do on a daily basis to help keep your staff and residents safe.